Hello, I'm Marianne Bartels, Chief Investment Strategist of Sanctuary Wealth. I'm really excited to welcome everyone to the first Friends of Sanctuary podcast, and I could not be more pleased to kick it off this monthly series with our esteemed guest, Jenny Johnson, Chief Executive Officer of Franklin Templeton. Our intention is that Friends of Sanctuary will be a place to dive in, to get to know business leaders, and take in-depth looks at the financial services industry and the trends that are driving it. So with that, Jenny, welcome. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, Jenny, Franklin Templeton has been a company that's been around for a long time. It's, it's a well-known name. And under your leadership, you have dramatically changed your company. Right now, you have $1.4 trillion in assets. You're a really, truly global company. And can you please share with us, because I'm not sure everyone understands how you have really transformed your company. <laughs> well, first of all, it, it is exciting. We, we celebrated uh, 75 years in 2022. So that was obviously a big milestone. Uh, really excited about it. I've been CEO for about three years, but been with the company for about 33 years. And, you know, in the, in the last three years, we've done eight acquisitions. Um, they were following on a couple of acquisitions even before that, where we were, we sat down, boy, it was probably, you know, 2016, 2017. Um, my brother, Greg Johnson, was the CEO and looked at trends in the industry and pr there were really two, I think, key trends that we were trying to address. One is this massive move to alternatives. Companies are waiting a lot longer to go public. And you, we, we've already seen institutions allocate to alternatives. I think we're going to see the next trend is going to be this democratization of alternatives. But companies, for example, in 2000, the average company went public after three years. 2019, the average company went public after eight to 10 years. And in 2023, they're now going, they're waiting 14 to 15 years. So that growth that used to be captured, say, in mutual funds and, and other kind of pooled assets in the public markets is now being captured in the private market. So we looked at that and said, we have to be in that space. And so we've done acquisitions in, in real estate, um, private credit, uh, secondary private equity. We've launched private equity and, and venture capital. So that was one area. And then the second area is this recognition, and I think it came out of 2008, that um, the financial advisor is now more of a financial planner. You know, there, there was a lot of push by the regulators to have more transparency in distribution fees that are paid. Uh, and so as you saw this push to fee-based, it changed kind of the desire of the types of products clients were looking for. And so, and, and it also required the financial advisor not just to be an investment manager, but really to be a full financial planner. And so we do investments in tools that help financial advisors be able to provide the full financial planning services. And so that's been the focus. So today, uh, we have clients in 155 countries. Um, uh, we offer, we're 1.4 trillion. We're actually the uh, top 10 alternatives manager. Most people think of us as very much a sort of retail uh, advisor, but we're really 50-50 institutional and, and wealth channel and, and, and very large in the alternatives. Now, you have a company that's been very deeply enriched with, with core values and a, a, and a mission. How do you take that and really transform that to your employees and to your clients. You know, it's funny. Um, so first of all, you know, Franklin Templeton was actually started technically by my grandfather, uh, but my father really was the one who grew the business. Uh, and my father always said, take care of the client and the business will take care of itself. And we then, I remember when we wrote our core values, I thought, well, this is a waste of time. Like, why do you have to tell people these core values? They're clients first, you know, working with important partnerships, working with integrity and measuring what you do. They're sort of obvious. Um, but I then had, I remember the person who ran our Australia business said, Jenny, I've worked in a lot of companies that espouse these same values. This is the first one, no matter what office you go to, people live and breathe by those. And I honestly believe that's kind of a top down. You reward people 
for following and doing what's right for the customer. Even though sometimes, and I have plenty of stories of it, where it's in the short term is bad for the business, but in the long term is where you build trust. And when we did a uh, brand analysis, one of the things that people said about Franklin Templeton is one of the most trusted names in the industry. That's, that's a beautiful story and one that really warms my heart personally. Now, Jenny, you know, the markets last year, we had a bear market in stocks, we had a bear market in bonds simultaneously, very, very rare. We open up the year, markets are up sharply. How are you advising your clients about how to position and, and look out for equities, bonds, alternatives for 2023? Well, honestly, I think the past decade has been really hard for active managers because when interest rates were kept so low and essentially governments around the world were printing money, the only place to put your money were in the equity markets or else in private assets because you couldn't get a return in fixed income. You had the TINA rule. There is no other alternative. <laughs> there is, exactly. Well, what happens when everybody's putting their money into equities? All equities go up. Everybody's a brilliant investor. Now you get times like this and you start to get volatility in the markets. And that's where it's, you know, benefits, real active management benefits. Volatility is a good thing. So we look at it and say, you know, a couple of things. One is, I think most people who are worried that there could be a hard landing or sort of pass that and saying, well, I don't, I don't think there's going to be a hard lane. We may have a recession, uh, but I don't know that it'll be a hard landing. So that's that's good. But if you look at corporate earnings, they haven't real. They're just now starting to adjust down. Most of last year's decline in the stock market was a reduction in multiples, right? So there's probably a little bit more there. Um, and then you look out and you say, well, all right, the, the U.S. has essentially pushed out inflation. It's made the dollar very, very strong. You look at emerging markets, for example, really cheap versus historical lows. But not all emerging markets are, are you know, going to be the winners. And so picking and choosing which ones are appropriate. We like dividend paying stocks, you know, more conservative stocks with strong balance sheets. It's, it's times like this where you Remember that dividends are 40% of the S&P return. So, you know, a lot of people forget that. Yes. And so as you're sitting here where we're qu not quite sure whether we're through things, it's really nice to get paid and to be with a good solid company that can withstand some of the, um, you know, difficulties. I do think probably most of, you know, the Fed, if I were to guess, I'd say they probably got two more 25 basis points increases and then they, they sit on it for a while. Um, you know, but that's probably built into the market. So, you know, maybe going a little bit longer term uh, uh, fixed income up, up till now. I think everybody's remained very short term, short duration. I, I don't think we're going to have a decline in in rates in 2023. I think with an election year in 2024, it's possible. Um, but I, I think probably 2023 will probably sit where rates are. And Jenny, I've heard you in, in other interviews, and I just want to bring this up because I just think it's so important, is you always talk about that the investor should be invested for the long term. Can yeah. you talk about that yeah. philosophy a little yeah. bit? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to give you two, two I think, really point um, data points. So number one, I think we all owe it to all 20-year-olds to convince them to get into the market. So if you start investing from uh, age 25, and let's say you put $7,000 away, uh, or even $5,000 away, and you get a 7% return for, for 10 years, so you invest between 25 and 35, $5,000 a year, you will have more money than the person who starts at age 35 and invests for 30 years at $5,000 a year. That's incredible. Right? So that, that compounding. compounding is so important. You've got to get in early. So that's lesson one. Number two, you can't time the market. So there are something like, I think, between um, uh, tw uh, 2002 and 2022, there's like 5,200 and something trading days. If you miss the top 10 best days in those 5,000 plus trading days, you lose 57% of the equity return in that entire 20 year period. So you think you can time to make sure that you, you know, can time to get the right 10 days? We never know what triggers those best days. And so staying in the market, I think, is probably the most important lesson. Get in early, stay in it, uh, and then you can move around within it once you're in there. But you don't want to try to time, time the market. That never ends well. I think that's terrific advice. Now, let's talk about China. There's a lot always going on in China. And now that they seem to have reopened, 
Um, and, and their markets have been uh, much less expensive, even relative to other emerging markets. What, what is the firm's outlook for you know, China, um, other emerging markets? How is it going to affect maybe economies? Just a broad overview sure, of, sure. of your thoughts. So I think one, as I mentioned earlier, I think, I think emerging markets are really cheap right now compared to developed markets. So uh, there are a lot of factors in there. And I, so I do think that it's a good time to be in the emerging markets. Um, I, I think China opening up is going to be very positive uh, for all the emerging markets. And, and I think for China, um, I, I do think that this um, diversification of supply chains is real. It takes time, but picking which countries will benefit from that, I think, is an opportunity. Um, I think with respect to U.S. and China relations, uh, that that's going to be, you know, it, it, China is the one thing that Democrats and Republicans both agree on. And so it's going to be difficult, um, but it's a real focus on specific sectors. So I think technology in China is going to be a difficult to be able to call that right, because you don't know what kind of regulations are going to come out. Um, we have a joint venture. We've had for a very long time a joint venture in China. Uh, we are very much committed to the joint venture and looking to actually own 100% of it because, you know, China is the second largest economy, likely to be the largest economy in the world. It's a place that any global investor has to, has to engage with. But picking and choosing your sectors is going to be important. Now, Jenny, you have a large organization. You have nearly 10,000 employees. You have many different fund managers. I'm sure they have many different views. Yes. So sure. how do you integrate that to one voice um, when you're talking to clients? So uh, we, we do have the Franklin Templeton Institute, which we will pull themes from various investment teams. But honestly, we don't have a house view. And we don't have a house view because um, you know, you take take our three fixed income managers, Western Asset Management, Brandywine, and, and Franklin Fixed Income. And honestly, they've actually had different views about the pace in which the Fed would raise rates, and they position portfolios differently. And there's very low correlation between the, the returns that have come between uh, those three managers. So, you know, we're, we're not looking for the house view. Often what we can bring to clients, which is kind of interesting, is opportunities to listen to the team's debate. Right. So, you know, anybody who has a single product to sell is going to come in and convince you very much why this is absolutely the right view. But actually being able to listen to people debating comfortably about what the views are, that has been very powerful for our institutional clients. Um, you know, we've had sovereign wealth funds. We just actually did it recently in the Middle East where, you know, when I traveled around, you'd listen to sovereign wealth funds. They always wanted to know what others were doing in the region. So we were able to pull together five of our macro economists all the way, you know, in our fixed income groups, plus our benefit street partners, our private credit team, and five sovereign wealth funds, and just have a closed door session about kind of debating about what, what the U.S. economy is going to do. And we're finding that that's hugely valuable for our clients. Oh, I could definitely on the institutional side, after spending so many years, I totally understand that. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I want to share with you that my aunt, my dad's little baby sister, went to Wall Street in 1956. I love Wim it. Women were not going to Wall Street no, in 1956. No. And she didn't want to go to the Wall Street in 1956. But her uncle got her a job on the trading floor of Ladenburg Thalman. And the funny part of the story was uh, she went for the interview. They called her and said that she had the job. She rejected the job four times. <laughs> but they kept calling. And she figured, well, I guess I really should just try this job for a year. And that turned into a whole career wow. on Wall Street, which is how I came to Wall Street because she started educating me as a young woman about finance and that it was important that I had to learn um, finances. But that makes me second generation Wall Street. Your grandfather founded the company in 1947 and then your father ran it. Now you're running it. That's third generation. Now I find when I'm out speaking, it's very rare that anybody has an, uh, a female relative that came up in the industry. Yeah. You know, at my age, being second generation, third, I've never met a third generation uh, woman before in the industry. Um, can you please, you know, tell us about how you grew up in the business and what the landscape was like back then, and you know, how are you seeing the industry shift? So, I mean, first of all, I um, 
I, I love to tell the story about my mother who had seven children and then uh, wanted to, to do something more. And so she went back to uh, college. Actually, she started going back to college when she was having kids and then graduated from Stanford Medical School. So I always like to say I'm a second generation, you know, guilty working mom, which is helpful. Uh, but having somebody like that who was successful as a woman, you know, role model, I think is really powerful. And I don't know that it has to always be in the same industry. It just has to be about you can actually do both. And your father supported it. And my father, like to, I, I think, um, I think it was Sheryl Sandberg who said in her book, you know, the, the most important career decision a woman can make is, you know, a supportive uh, partner. Uh, and I think that that's very true. I mean, my father was very supportive of my mother doing that. Um, so, you know, when you ask, like, in the 33 years I've been in this industry, what have I seen? Uh, I think that there's a real genuine appreciation now for the fact that diverse views are going to be valuable in and create opportunity. I always say that DNI is a growth story. Uh, and the example I use is, you know, today, um, venture capital is uh, less than 2% of venture capital goes to female entrepreneurs. Only 12% of VCs are women. And when the women are turned down, 57% of them say they didn't understand my business case. So, and then I go to the story. We were one of the first uh, to back the, a company called Rent the Runway. Oh, yes. And, and I, tell I have you, rented from Rent the too. Runway. <laughs> me too. And I tell the story, like, can you imagine you're pitching to a bunch of male venture capitalists and, and the woman saying like, well, you can't wear the same dress to the gala again, you know, I mean, you just can't. And you're talking to these guys who are all wearing the same tuxedo that they've had for 20 years and they're just hoping they can button it, right? Like the, 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 you can see how the business case could be lost. So I think there's a recognition that having diverse views, but the problem is, honestly, it's way easier to talk to somebody who agrees with you because you always say, oh, they're so smart. They're clearly very bright. It's a lot of work to have to debate with somebody who doesn't agree with you. And yet it's been proven that over and over that better outcomes come from actually people who have better debates. I have a friend who's a professor at Berkeley who uh, her whole career is on the concept that the devil's advocate doesn't work. To really get better outcomes, you have to have two people who have diametrically opposed views. And in their effort to prove it out, they start to create different ways of thinking about it to support their view. And that's where you get these breakthrough moments. So I do think, listen, we're still early days, as you know, um, but I do think there's a genuine appreciation. And diversity looks like a lot of different things. I mean, gender is just one. Ethnicity is, of course, one. Socioeconomic background, education, all of those things are part of the diversity story. And as we get more of that in the people making investment decisions, I think it both benefits society as well as we'll have better investment returns. I just want to share this because you sparked a memory for me. Um, my first job, my uh, role model was a woman. You know, it's rare that I had it's an rare, aunt. Yeah. She you know, pushed me to go out and, and work in the industry first, and my first boss was a female. And back then, we really weren't using computers yet, right. believe it or not. <laughs> I know. It's hard to admit that we were all part of that. <laughs> and we used to get these iBest books of earnings estimates. And what she would make me do is find the analyst that was the most bullish and find the analyst that was the most bearish to get that tail that you're talking That's about. Exactly, yep, yeah. And I, that is so, so true. I didn't realize how important that was that I was even learning that at, at yeah. such a tender age, yeah, actually. Yeah. But it really did work that we got better analysis uh, when we were looking at uh, each both side. Sides. Now, obviously, we would choose a side, yeah, yeah. but it was really helpful to, to, to see sure. both sides. Now, for the first time in history, um, women CEOs now make up over 10%. And as a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, no less, right? Um, as a female CEO of a Fortune 500 company, why is this significant? Like, how, how would you like to express the importance? Because I, I have to just share, my aunt, when she was coming up in the business, she did meet other women, and they used to meet for lunch anytime somebody got a promotion because nobody celebrated them. Oh, interesting. They yeah. celebrated yeah. themselves. So this is a milestone for, for not just you, but I believe it's a milestone for women that you're running a Fortune 500 company. You're an elite group. Um, 
why why is this significant? Why is this significant? And what more needs to be done um, to add to diversity, um, equity, and inclusion? If you can expand a little, you, you touched upon it a little bit, but expand a little bit more in what it means for women. You know, I think they're doing um, a lot. The, you know, the issue is why women haven't risen to the top is really a multifactorial problem or issue. And we all want sort of the silver bullet of, if we could just solve this, it'll be the answer. Um, you know, it starts with things like job descriptions, right? They're, they're starting to understand that there are certain words that we use in job descriptions that will turn all women away from that job. Number two, women genuinely have to know themselves that they can accomplish all of the job before they'll put their hat in the ring to, to take it, whereas men will you know, have half of the capability and be confident enough with that. Um, a friend of mine, Stacy Cunningham, who used to be the head of the New York Stock Exchange, tells a story about her boss, he was gonna leave, and he came to her and he said, I'm thinking about leaving and I need to find um, a successor. Who do you think that should be? She went around looking all over for the successor and then somebody finally said to her, he wants to know if you want it. And it never had occurred to her. And then when she went back to him, he kind of said, yeah, I don't think you're ready because you would have put your hat in the ring if you'd been ready. And it was the second time around that she actually got the job. So women's, you know, aren't always as confident to, to, to lean in. Uh, and then there become issues around, I think um, we know men do a better job with their networks. N men tend to do really broad networks. Uh, women need, tend to do deep need, networks. You need uh, mentors, you need sponsors. Yes. Correct? Yes. And and actually on that networking thing, I did have, so I have a group of, of women that were, are in the industry and we get together and we just sort of, in, three of us decided we needed to have a better network in the industry. And so we just invited a, 18 women to go away on this trip. We didn't know who was gonna show up. And now this group is really, really uh, close. And we've helped each other with jobs and you know, put pe people on boards and various things. But one of the women's husband, who's a very senior executive on Wall Street said to me, he goes, you know what's really powerful about that group is, he said, I do all these trips. I'll go golfing with men. I'll do a fishing trip with men. And when they call me, one, I'll take the phone call, and two, I'm predisposed to help them. It's not that I can necessarily help them, but that hurdle is huge. But women, because we don't have as big of a network, right, we don't get the phone call picked up. And so one of the things we as a group have decided is we're gonna expand the network. So we do these dinners and we'll invite one or two from the group and then invite others around to try to expand that network and be very conscious about it. So I think that's gonna be important. And then I would say for me, uh, in the decision of the board to put me on the, uh, you know, to, to make me CEO, having two female women on the board was actually uh, important. They were my advocates to speak um, to speak up at, at times. And so, again, having, you know, that um, women in those positions, I think, will help others. One of the things that I struggled with, and it took me a while to learn, is that the men were very good at telling their bosses or showing their bosses their accomplishments. I think it, whether it's culturally or just just how we're brought up, we're, we're not taught to brag about ourselves. Right. For sure. We're, we we expect our bosses to, to, know. to just know we're yeah. sitting there, we're doing the Obviously, job, we're, know, getting, it, we're yeah. getting it done. And it wasn't until I started speaking yeah. up and getting people to write complimentary emails and sending them to my boss that they started to pay attention. Yeah. So, so you understand, you've seen that, you've seen I, this I've seen before. It. And I've seen um, people be very successful at taking credit for other people's uh, ideas. And so if you're not speaking up and showing that you did it, it's not uncommon for somebody else to take credit for successes. Yeah, I've seen that too. <laughs> um, my aunt and her friends were very big. And now this, I'm going back to the 1970s. Um, to try to bring women into the business, they would actually go out to the colleges yeah. and speak to the women to educate them about what the opportunities that Wall Street had for women because nobody was really telling them. Yeah. They, they didn't yeah. know. How can we better educate women so they are aware of the, of the opportunities? 
So we're very focused, and this is something I'm passionate about, right? Because I always say like, I can go hire a woman from my competitor and bring her in and my numbers look better, but we've accomplished nothing as an industry. So we have to change the pipeline. And I think changing the pipeline, so we're, we partner with uh, Girls Who Invest, um, uh, with uh, some uh, historically black, black colleges and universities to both do at the high school level, uh, and at the college level to do internships, right? So the good news is if you aren't raised with somebody, if you didn't have your aunt in the industry, you may never have thought about it, right? So if you don't have that role model in your circle, you're not even gonna be considered as a, a good fit for you. But if you can come in, have a good experience as a summer intern, you're seeing an increased number who then say, you know what, it's a great industry for me, I can see myself here. So I think we gotta do more of that and we have to, you know, and I, I tell the story about talking to my uh, daughters about would any of them follow me in the business, which none of them are, so I've clearly failed. At least for now. <laughs> At least for now, yeah. <laughs> um, and one of them said, no mom, I wanna do something that helps people. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is a business that helps people. It's a great business to help people. And I think we have to do a better job at describing what it is that we do. Uh, you know, I can't think of a business that isn't more motivated to help people with all of whatever their personal goals and passions are. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that. All right, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, what value do you place on diversifying your your product offering? Because now you have a very diversified product offering that you're offering out to your institutional clients and to financial advisors. How are you answering the needs of the modern wealth um, advisor, especially in the independent channel? Well, so as you know, I touched on earlier, I think that that people are looking to their financial advisor to be a true financial planner. They're not just looking for an investment uh, uh, manager. And that has put a lot of pressure on financial advisors. And so it's actually changed how they've had to approach the business, I think. Uh, I, I actually think people look to their financial advisor like the ultra wealthy used to look to their big trust companies. We have fiduciary trust was you know, which, which we own was, was uh, set up by five wealthy families a long time ago. And what do they focus on? I say, you know, wealthy people focus on investment returns, uh, tax efficiency, because they're all in the high tax bracket, estate planning, because, you know, an entrepreneur doesn't want to give 55% to the government. And then they want their children to be productive and not ne'er-do-wells. And the older and wealthier they get, their priorities. The children are first all the way down to investment performance is last. And so that has now shifted to being on the financial uh, advisor in the independent channel, right? There, I've, I've talked to one advisor who said they had to negotiate the prenup agreement on behalf of a client because the client's like, look, you're my financial person. I don't want to have that conversation. So what we're trying to do is not only provide a suite of products and they're, they're often much more goals oriented. So goals based or yep. solutions based, you know, uh, uh, somebody who's retired an income type product or, uh, you know, whatever the kind of needs are to be able to provide model portfolios that have that outcome, but also to provide tools that can be useful for financial advisors. So, you know, we, we invested in a, or we own now a, a CRM system that can help advisors grow their business. Um, we, we bought a, a platform canvas that is uh, providing kind of, uh, it, it will ultimately do uh, SMAs of active accounts. It can do um, direct indexing, uh, but it overlays tax efficiency and will ultimately have an ESG ability to tilt portfolios based on individuals' needs, right? So it changes how that advisor is communicating with the clients. And so we are investing in the tools to be able to offer those up in the channel in addition to investment products. Oh, that's awesome. Um, you've moved pretty aggressively in the alt space and you've, you've um, integrated some really good companies with very, very good returns. How important are alts um, to your client base? And, and how do you see this changing and shifting uh, in the advisor portfolios? So I actually think we're at a moment with that I put akin to when my grandfather decided to get in the mutual fund business, right? So when he got in the mutual fund business, the average investor could not access the equity markets. Uh, and get diversification and, you know, at a reasonable price. And so the idea was let's pool these assets and give diversification expert management at a reasonable price. Well, now what's happening because companies are waiting so long to go public, as I mentioned earlier, you're having there, a lot of that growth that used to be captured in IPOs is now being captured in the private markets. 
In the case of private credit, you know, with the, the types of regulation that came out of the financial crisis, like Basel III in Europe and, and the U.S. regulation, banks' capital has become so much more precious that they're only using it for their biggest and best clients, which means that the average small business can't get a loan. So it's created this private credit market. So now you look at it and you say, all right, uh, f to be able to offer a full spectrum of capabilities, you have to be able to tap into those private markets returns. The problem is they're illiquid. And you, it really takes the, the advisor to understand the client and their needs with liquidity to be able to figure out whether it's appropriate to tap in. But I am passionate about the democratization of, of alternatives into really the wealth channel. But again, really being able to be customized by that financial advisor. And I, I would use the example, you know, if you have a client who has $5 million, you might say, well, I could put a million dollars in private illiquid assets, but maybe they're big spenders and they're drawing down on it. And so you say, well, I can't tie them up. And yet you might have another client who has a million dollars in savings, but they never allocate and they're always putting money away. Well, you might say, oh, poor a portion of that go private markets. So the excess returns though in private markets can be significant. The top performing, top quartile private equity managers over the bottom quartile outperformed by 20% a year. So just think about that 20%. In real estate, the top quartile real estate managers outperformed by 10% a year for a 20 year period. The top performing private credit was 5% a year versus the bottom quartile. So if you get the right managers, you can get really excess returns. The problem is the top you know, performing ones aren't on sale. They don't, they're not gonna uh, negotiate fees. And we've trained people to think so much about fees that they're gonna, if they, they want the ones on, on sale, it's gonna be the bottom quartile. And that's my one worry about that. But I do think we're at this moment where you have to be able to bring in responsibly, whether it's managed accounts, um, I think 401k plans are a great way to do it, uh, but to bring some amount of those private market returns into uh, you know, the average investor's portfolio. And are you seeing that percentage begin to increase yeah. over it, time? Yes, and you definitely um, uh, are hearing managers you know, talking about some of the big wirehouses have already said, we're at a three, three to five percent allocation. We can see this getting up to a 10 percent allocation. The challenge for the independents are it's a lot of paperwork. It's following up on capital calls. There's a huge amount of administration that happens to be able to bring, not only is it you know, a tied up asset, so you gotta make sure it's appropriate from a suitability standpoint, but it's actually quite cumbersome. Now there are companies like Case and iCapital that are trying to improve that for the independent advisor. We've, we have products on those platforms, but it's still messy versus being able to just say, ah, oh, I'm gonna buy a mutual fund or I'm gonna buy a stock. So when I actually retired, you may not know, but I worked for Merrill Lynch for over 20 years and, you know, I hung up my hat and I you retired. You just got bored. You couldn't do it. <laughs> and what I wound up doing, I knew about this thing called Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, there's something going on here. So when I was in retirement, I started taking classes on decentralized finance, right? It's a big name. It's, it's not just about Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. You have blockchain. Um, and it, it, it was a headache because there's a whole new language that yeah. I had to learn, but there's, there, there's a movement that's happening and the younger people are very interested in the democratization of finance, yeah. but the technology is critical. Blockchain is critical. And I'd love to know your views because I think you have some pretty good views and strong, <laughs> strong views, views. <laughs> on where blockchain is going in the industry. Yeah. yeah, no. So what I like to say is, is Bitcoin is the greatest uh, distraction from what is the greatest disruption that's coming to financial services. I think that is one of the best lines. <laughs> so I, I used to just say Bitcoin will be zero, right? Because governments will never cede their currency. Uh, I did then have somebody uh, who's... Uh, you know, from Israel runs a uh, robo platform there. And he said, hey, my parents and their parents had their money taken away by governments. They will always put some amount where the government can't reach it and Bitcoin's that that option. So there's a- And that used to be gold for many exactly, families. Exactly, exactly. So Bitcoin is the fear option like gold. Uh, and so therefore it'll have some value. The problem is from an investment standpoint, that can be a little bit challenging. But now you think about it and say, well, where is the disruption coming? This is a technology that essentially is going to be, um, 
because it's so efficient in how it is going to handle transactions, it takes the friction, frictional costs out of transactions. And if you can do that, you can fractionalize assets at a different level. So what do I mean by that? So you can imagine the Empire State Building could be sold and everybody could own. Well, actually, I'll, I'll use a real example. There is a Four Seasons, I think, in Aspen that has been tokenized. Really cumbersome, done with the REIT, but the concept is there and the technology now exists to really do this without the REIT. But you can own your, say, one one hundred thousandths of, a, uh, of the Four Seasons. The smart contract pays you your earnings. It's very efficient that way. And when you check into the Four Seasons, they say, oh, you're an owner. I'll give you a room upgrade, right? It's a loyalty program too. And the only reason that you can do that kind of thing is because they've been able to embed like the title, right? So with property ownership, the title can be built into the smart contract. You don't have to pay a third party title company to go and be able to prove ownership. And so as soon as you can do that, you're going to start to unlock these tied up assets. And there are some, you know, the way, if you think about Web 2.0, right, it allowed you to unlock big assets. Your home, you could monetize because you could participate in Airbnb. Your car, you could monetize it because you could become an Uber driver at night. Well, because this, this is driving out the costs, there are actually companies today, this company Helium has a two-year waiting list where you basically buy their router and they take your excess capacity on your internet and they pay you for that capacity. Or a company that wants to be the fastest streaming service, while you're watching their content, they're caching on your device. And if the person next to you then wants to watch it, it only has to jump from your device to their device and they pay you to do it. So now you're building their network. So you're like an equity investor because they're paying you in their coins, right? You're actually a client because you're watching their TV, but you're also part of their technology infrastructure. They don't have to buy as much, you know, a Microsoft cloud computing because they have all these customers who are actually part of like their IT department. So it's those types of creative business models that are going to, uh, I, I think, come out of this blockchain. We have a tokenized money market fund. We were the first to get SEC approval. So we've had for now over two years, um, a blockchain money market fund, we've built an entire transfer agency system in blockchain. It is highly efficient in how it handles it. We also have a crypto wallet. That's just the beginning. We're going to start to launch other products. We believe there should be regulation in this space. And the SEC has been great working with us on it. Um, but that you will start to express pretty unique, including things like uh, intellectual property, cultural assets, artwork, um, song, loyalty, royalties, those are all going to be able to be tokenized and the smart contract's going to enable the payment that's going to allow a lot of people to participate in a space they haven't been able to. I'm sorry, but I have to ask this question after listening to all of that. Do you think it's possible at some point they tokenize the markets? Oh, 100%. Oh, there's already people working on it. I mean, wh why, why can't you... Um, you know, have a stock reflected in a token and have it tr uh, trading 24 by 7, right? Why is that not happening? I mean, why does the New York Stock Exchange close at 4 o'clock in the afternoon? Because it used to be that everybody had to settle their paperwork, right? Now the efficiencies of the exchanges are such that I think over time you're going to see that. Now the regulation has got to get comfortable with it, but I think we'll absolutely have that. Well, in talking about where we are in the industry today and, and where we're going, how do you see, based on all this new technology, where we're going to be in, in the next three to five years? And especially if you can incorporate millennials, right? Because they're the ones that are really looking at this technology and embracing the technology, and they're going to be the next big investor. Yeah. So I think the good news is, and I always say this in our, you know, 75 year history, one thing that has never changed is we're trying to help people achieve their goals. And, you know, often they're, I want financial independence and be able to support myself through retirement. I want to help my kids go to college. I want to buy a house. Right. So those goals kind of haven't changed. And then it's just about, I think the technology is enabling us to, to deliver customized, better risk understood portfolios and actually overlay uh, people's personal goals. So I think you know there's a lot of noise in the U.S. about ESG. So let me touch on that. I think I think that 
the 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 challenge in that space is that it got pulled into a political environment about you know don't invest in this fossil fuel company you must do you know these types of companies the reality is people's investment portfolios have to have returns right that is the per the, the fiduciary, you know, component of that, our, our Ann Simpson, our head of ESG, always says, everybody forgot the F in ESG, you know, fi <laughs> fiduciary and financial returns. So that has to be part of it. But if you can still get good, your desired, really good financial returns and tilt a portfolio towards your personal passion, maybe it's gender equality, maybe it's companies that have, you know, more women on the board or whatever those things are, those are the tilt that you get. So I think that one thing that we will see in portfolios is you will start to talk to clients and say, here's your return, and it'll often be more solutions-based, which advisors have always understood, right? You're on your path to meeting these goals. Here are the underlying ESG risks to this portfolio that we built. You're a little bit overweight energy because you wanted an income generating portfolio and they pay good dividends, utilities pay good dividends. Uh, and then, oh, by the way, here's the good you're doing externally, right? And so those will be three parts of, of communicating it. The, I, I do think that ultimately all this stuff gets expressed in a tokenization, right? It, we, we will, you know, it won't be ETFs, it'll be, think about an ETF today. An ETF today really trades all day, but only kind of prices the NAV like twice a day. A, a tokenized smart contract is going to be able to know exactly what the NAV is at every millisecond. And so you will actually know what the NAV of, of the underlying assets of that pooled asset. Uh, and so I think that, that becomes part of the, um, you know, the, you all can, of these things will be represented. You get tokens. true transparency. You get true transparency. Good way to put it. Well, Jenny, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today. Right. Thank you. You have provided such a wealth of information for our viewers. And I want to thank you for all for tuning in. Thank you for watching or listening to the first Friends of Sanctuary podcast. Tune in next month to be sure not to miss out on the next installment of the series. Securities offered through Sanctuary Securities, Inc., member FINRA, SIPC Advisory Services, offered through Sanctuary Advisors, LLC, and the SEC Registered Investment Advisor, Sanctuary Securities, Inc., and Sanctuary Advisors, LLC, are wholly owned subsidiaries of Sanctuary Wealth Group, LLC.